It's a bear. Good morning. Hey, what's up? This is Brian Kuzmar from Commercial Rare Coins and Precious Metals in beautiful Lauderdale by the Sea. I uh, have uh, the Deerfield Live underwater beach cam up, and I guess these guys are coming in for a close up here. Uh, really, though, it's been really wavy out there and pretty stormy. If you're wondering why, uh, normally this camera is pretty clear and crystal clear blue, uh, but we got a lot of waves, a lot of weed, and a lot of wind out there for the last week or two, as most of you know. And there goes the phones ringing. <laughs> so uh, look at these guys. Uh, oh boy, they're coming in for a close up there. Uh, beautiful. This is, again, if you live in South Florida, this is a Deerfield Beach uh, Pier. Uh, they have a cam underneath there, and if you've ever visited that area, uh, you're not going to see it, but uh, I think it's one of the coolest cams in the country and you can really see some cool fish down here and uh, for you folks that live outside uh, my area here uh, this is a live Deerfield Beach cam they're on uh, a YouTube uh, Florida USA underwater camera uh, boy I could sit here and just watch this forever and most of you that watch my videos have heard me say that a billion times well let's move into today's prices it looks like the coin said a bear and uh, <clears throat> I kind of feeling it's a bull market. I disagree with the coin today for sure. I kind of felt that way. And uh, we're up uh, $6 in gold right now, ranged in eight, eight, basically 1800 if you take a look there, uh, to 1817 So, you know, trading in a $20 range thereabouts. Sitting right in the middle right now. Uh, silver sitting at $2,596. I'm sorry, $2,619, my apology. A low at $2,596 and a high at $2,637. Uh, again, 50 cent range it's been in. Uh, platinum still holding above that $1,100 mark, uh, which is nice. Even on the low, it still held the, the $1,100 uh, overnight. So uh, uh, things seem to be holding steady, uh, which is a good thing. There's nothing crazy going on. They didn't get monkey hammered this week and not so much last week. So uh, silver has been holding on to this $26 range for what weeks now. Uh, gold as well, sitting around this $1,800 range. We're just waiting for... When is the next uh, breakout on the upside? I don't see a long-term breakout on the downside. I could see some more monkey hammering, which just provides some people with the ability to do what? Buy the friggin' dips, as we always talk about. So uh, for those of you that are already in this market, uh, you can just sit and wait. And, uh, you know, when you see these down markets for a week or whatever in precious metals, when you see them get monkey hammered, just relax, you know. Uh, don't even look at the computer. I mean, if you're bought in already, don't even look at the computer prices because uh, it's really not going to affect you. You're in this for the uh, uh, medium and long term uh, gold and silver and precious metals are about wealth preservation it's not about uh, being a casino or getting rich quick if you want to do that as I say go to Las Vegas or or get into the crypto market um, the next time it starts moving up so uh, here we are here we are we're in a sideways market not too much happening again great time of year to go on vacation and not look at the gold price for a week or two if you if, if you don't have any more money and you're not interested in buying a dips if you're still interested in buying a dips then uh, you know hey keep your eyes you got to watch this market daily the, there are opportunities to buy at lower prices right here in this what I call bull market that we're in right now so take a look at my little cursor uh, and for a lot of folks that aren't familiar with precious metals markets aren't familiar with markets in general uh, markets uh, don't really, you know how a graph looks like and follow my cursor. Markets really don't look like this. You know, 45 degree bull markets don't look like this always. Um, I mean, they can have a, a, a smaller slope or smaller degree of angle on the graph. Uh, they don't always look like that, though. Uh, the markets, when you get closer and closer to them, they kind of get choppy like this. And you see that choppiness, right? Uh, so uh, the closer you get, too, the bigger that choppiness looks on a graph. That's one of the things about graphs that kind of scares people. Uh, you really, I'm not a big graph guy myself, but uh, uh, for me, graphs tell you where you've been. They can show you uh, uh, where you've been, but not really uh, uh, where you're going necessarily. Uh, but in my opinion, we are in a bull market. And if you were to look at past bull markets, does the graph look the same? Well, I'm sure it does. I'm sure there's that choppiness. You couldn't lay one bull market graph for gold and silver over another and expect the exact same choppiness, the exact same degree of angle on the chart, given that you're using a similar type chart and time frame. Uh, however, these markets, uh, bull markets, are very choppy, and they don't happen overnight. You know, the crypto market, for some folks that have gotten into the silver and gold market uh, that were recently in crypto markets or watch crypto markets go crazy, that's not a normal market, folks. I mean, very seldom do you see things go from $200 to 30000 or 50000 <clears throat> and then drop back almost, you know, just as quickly down to uh, 30 or whatever. Uh, that's... Uh, 
I mean, maybe that is a market, I guess. You know, I'm I'm a free market capitalist, so I can say for certain that it is a market. However, that's too volatile of a market for for myself. And uh, again, I'm I'm all about physical, holding physical, and more than getting rich quick. I don't like get rich quick schemes. I don't like get rich things. Um, I'm sure, would I participate maybe if I really strongly felt that I could make money? Yes. Would I put a lot of money into it? No. I'd put only enough money in that I felt I could lose. Never, you know, never invest more than you than you can afford to lose, uh, uh, unless you're just going for the great gamble. So, you know, putting everything on black or red or whatever, going to Las Vegas, and then again, that's exactly what you're doing. You're gambling and going to Vegas. Gold, silver is about uh, wealth preservation. It's not about getting rich quick. And if you want to preserve your wealth and the wealth of your family, uh, you're in a good place. Let's take a look at ZH articles here. A um, couple articles here by Monetary Metals. I like their articles as well. Um, and uh, in brief, gold creeps higher. Uh, Vince is a chartish guy. He likes charts and stuff like that, and very good at it. Uh, but I'm not going to get into the charts or anything today as well. Um, again, I don't really follow charts or, or too much either. Um, so uh, let's take a look at uh, what other uh, news is out there. Uh, Elon seems to be in a little trouble there. That doesn't surprise me. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, the Financial Times is carrying an argument for central planning of the economy. That doesn't surprise me, too. Uh, for those that don't know it, and anybody that's read the Financial Times, FT, they are a corporate publication to me that uh, uh, is somewhat socialist, not somewhat, so definitely socialist, uh, bordering on Marxist, in my opinion. But uh, again, I'm a uh, old school, uh, a classic liberal. Uh, uh, libertarian, uh, constitutionalist, whatever you want to call me. Uh, so, but uh, the, you know that is the talk out there. We've talked about it, MMT. You know, you've got uh, our legislators here in the United States, our socialist Marxist legislators in in DC, uh, uh, pushing for MMT, modern, you know, uh, monetary theory. You know, giving away free money, uh, Keynesian uh, on uh, LSD. That's what that is, in my opinion. <laughs> so, uh, or. Uh, <laughs> Well, anyways, um, uh, it's it's the talk out there, folks, and you know it's really the end time when they start talking about that. I mean, it, it, it it's not a good deal. It's not a good deal. We we we've not uh, uh, run our economic. Uh, uh, house very well here in the United States. We haven't done it for a long time, and now you can have these uh, Marxists and socialists stand up and start pointing at that house. Uh, but what we haven't had, we haven't had free market capitalism in this country for a long time. We've had crony capitalism. Who's in control? Major corporations, billionaires, those with influence in Washington, D.C. That is a form of crony capitalism. This is not free market capitalism. The people that have access to the laws, uh, the people that have access to uh, uh, getting cheap free money or cheap easy money, I maybe call it free. Uh, the, these are the elite, these are the people that, uh, it's, it's a form of crony capitalism what we live in. And you know, a lot these Marxists and socialists, uh, they can spot that even, they're not that stupid. And if they can spot it, I mean, I've obviously spotted, uh, this is the issue. Until we fix it and go back to a free market capitalist system, uh, we're fucked. Excuse my language, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Hopefully Marcelo believed that one. Uh, let me move along here, and here's a good example of that right there. Um, <laughs> Oh boy, and the and the uh, uh, circus continues here. So uh, bubbles last until they don't. I like this article. I'm going to quickly read it here real quick. I quickly read it real quick. Boy, that's was that uh, a double negative? No, no, it was something. <laughs> Not good uh, English, though. Sorry about that. Quickly read it quick. Um, bubbles last until they don't. And uh, this is by uh, Lance Roberts, RealInvestmentAdvice.com. And I'm going to, bubbles are evident and only get acknowledged after they pop. Such is because during the inflation phase of the market bubble, investors rationalize uh, why this time is different. You know, you've heard that. It's different this time. It's different this time. Uh, uh, you hear socialists say that as well. It's different this time. <laughs> so uh, I digress. We're talking about uh, financial markets. Uh, we have seen examples of this rationalization over the last couple of years, such as stocks are cheap based on economic growth, low interest rates justify high valuations or the moral hazard of the Fed put. Other examples come from the analysis of stock prices, such as this tweet recently. Uh, went from nowhere, the average stock in North America went from nowhere five years up 14%, not exactly what I would call a bubble. 
Um, while the analysis is correct, average stock prices do not solely define a bubble. Such is where we need to start. Now, uh, some of you folks are familiar with what a bubble is, but you know I like this. And oh, actually, they quote Investopedia, which I actually looked up here before I looked at this article for another article. So, uh, what is a bubble according to Investopedia? Uh, Investopedia is one of my favorite sites. Don't look at Wikipedia ever for financial terms. They're horrible uh, because they're so political. They could go at politics too. I wouldn't look at anything political on uh, Wikipedia either. But nothing financial, uh, history stuff. Not, not even history stuff. I, I like some stuff about nature and those and some science things when they don't politicize it but uh, I digress again Investopedia is a great site to look up uh, 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 terms and such and definitions uh, a bubble is a market cycle that is characterized by the rapid es escalation of market value particularly in the price of assets typically what creates a bubble is a surge in asset prices driven by exuberant market behavior well here we go during a bubble assets typically trade at a price that greatly exceeds the assets intrinsic value that's an important little statement there folks uh, and basically what they're saying is um, uh, fundamentals don't matter it's not what the company is selling uh, it's not the company's sales it's not how great the company's product is it's simply that the money the company is being fed more money uh, that's when a company exceeds you know the assets intrinsic value in my opinion rather the price does not align with fundamentals of the asset there you go I'm sorry they finished the statement there before I, I uh, drifted off with my ADD uh, this definition is suitable for our discussions. There are three components of a bubble. The first two, price and valuation, as noted as above, are getting dismissed or rationalized during the inflation phase. That rationalization is due to investor psychology, the fear of missing out, F-O, oh, I forgot about that term, F-O-M-O, the fear of missing out. Uh, that's something we recently had big time in the crypto markets, the fear of missing out. Uh, so Jeremy Grantham posted the follow 48 uh, years of price bubbles in the markets during the inflation phase. Each got rationalized. This time is different. Uh, so here we are. Uh, there's the gold. Remember, uh, remember, uh, remember, uh, sorry, my English went to uh, uh, my working class roots. Sorry about that. Uh, remember when uh, uh, gold uh, uh, bubbled, and uh, I do, gold bubbled in the 1980s. Uh, some will say it bubbled in 2012. I don't really believe that. I think it just got monkey hammered in uh, 2012 and that the uh, next point up was much higher uh, and until there was intervention by central banks and uh, sleazy people out there, in my opinion, uh, to drive the gold and silver markets down in 2012. But there you go. There's a gold uh, asset bubble right there. Gold was at, uh, what, 800 bucks an ounce or so in 1980. And, you know, in today's dollars, that's huge. I mean, that's bigger than any market we've seen in gold uh, since then. Uh, there's the uh, uh, Nikon market. There's, uh, what does that say, Thailand? I'm not familiar with that. Tech stocks, U.S. housing, uh, the China bubble, the biotech bubble. Uh, however, here, let me move along here. However, we are most interested in the third component of this bubble, which is investor psychology. Uh, Charles Kennelberg noted that speculative mania is typically commenced with a displacement that excites speculative interest. Then the speculation becomes reinforced by positive feedback loop from the rising prices. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a big circle jerk there going on. <laughs> Such ultimately induces in, inexperienced rest or in, investors to enter the market at the positive feedback loop, and the euphoria increases. Retail investors begin to leverage their risk as, in the markets as the rationality weakens. During the mania, speculations become more diffused and spread to different asset claims. New companies come to the market to take advantage of the euphoria and investors leverage their gains using derivatives, stock loans, and leverage instruments. Well, he's basically showing how, uh, oh look, financial crisis, Brexit, uh, Tim, really good article. I'm going to go to the top here, but uh, what really uh, I liked was this graph here. Mostly, <laughs> I got to admit, I wanted to read some of the article here. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to show you at the top where to read it for yourself here, uh, which I, I'm a big believer, and I, I don't want to sit here and read everything. Well, and we'll be here all day too. Uh, there are several psychological uh, phases investors go through during a full market cycle. We love this graph here: uh, optimism, enthusiasm, exuberance, euphoria. Uh, greed by highest level of financial risk, anxiety, and denial. And there's a down. There's a downside to it: despair, panic, capitulation, uh, discouragement, and uh, uh, best time for investing. And then you get dismay, hope, relief, and optimism. Well, since 2000, uh, I guess the last bull market I think that we had, the uh, bull, I'm uh, not bull, but bubble market we had was in uh, 1980. I'm not going to call 2012, even though 2012 we hit highs. 
Uh, I think 2012 was monkey hammered down. And you know what we did not see in 2012 as far as the physical markets go? Uh, maybe on the paper markets we saw, but we never saw capitulation in the physical markets in 2012. So uh, any of you that uh, are familiar, again, physical markets, didn't see capitulation in the physical markets in 2012. It seemed to be all paper driven, uh, that monkey hammered, uh, monkey hammer we had in 12 uh, before we've had our next up run. Uh, so uh, I believe that we are still in the uh, uh, this stage right here, optimism. Uh, I believe that uh, relief and optimism. I think that we're still in this stage uh, from from 1980s bull market. I think what happened is that uh, we we uh, uh, we got monkey hammered here and get kind of dropped back down to the the hope area after 2012. But I believe that ultimately this is where we are right now, uh, probably in the optimism area uh, of our bull market. Uh, where does it go from there? It goes into enthusiasm, exuberance, and euphoria. But it's taking us. I believe, uh, I believe we're in the relief stage in 2015, 2016, uh, in my opinion. And the hope stage, somewhere, like I said, uh, 2012, we completely skipped that capitulation stage. Uh, so, again, I digress here. I don't want to go too crazy into this article. Uh, sentiment cycle, another great chart here. Enthusiasm, it means high optimism, easy credit, rush of offering, risky stocks, outperforming stretched valuations. Um, uh, returning confidence. Well, here's the circle of the sentiment cycle. Extreme pessimism, oversold breath, risky stocks crash, negative, blah, blah, blah. Uh, disturbance, stocks go nowhere, trend followers suffer some pockets of outperformance credits. Uh, so that's discouragement stage, returning confidence. Uh, so uh, as far as investment sentiment cycle in precious metals, I believe we are probably between this these two stages right here. Um, we're still not in the high optimism stage. I think we're kind of mid-level here. Or maybe getting too, uh, uh, high here, but we're not even close to that panic level here. So, uh, and that chart is a little short. I think there's a few more things that it could add in there. Uh, let's run through that list. Uh, wow, I could go through um, uh, uh, this whole. Boy, this is a long article too. Give me one second here. Let me just see if there's anything I want to stretch or, or stretch. I saw the word stretched. <laughs> go into here. Uh, every bubble has two components: an underlying trend that prevails in reality, and a misconception relating to that trend. Uh, good, good uh, points there. Uh, so, oh, here, this is one I saw earlier. I wanted to read to you too. So, what can you do to navigate a bubble? Uh, and I, I like these points that they, he made here. Avoid the herd mentality of paying increasingly high prices without sound reasoning. All right, makes sense to me. Uh, do your own research and avoid confirmation bias. Well, that's something we've talked about on these videos uh, for a year now. Uh, develop a sound long-term investment strategy includes risk management protocols. Uh, you know, we haven't talked too much about risk management protocols with uh, uh, precious metals. I've delved into a little bit that I think that when we hit bubble territory in gold and silver, we do need to sell into that uh, because it's, it's a high chance that we'll be buying back at a lower level. Uh, but you have to be able to recognize that bubble first. And uh, I don't even think we're close to it, and that's why I don't talk about it. Uh, develop a um, diversify your portfolio allocation model to include safer assets. Uh, I agree. Control your greed and resist the temptation to get rich quick. Ah, what do we talk about all the time? Uh, exactly that. This, uh, precious metals is about what? Wealth preservations. WP. Uh, resist getting caught up in what could have been or anchor to past value. Uh, that's true. Getting caught up in past markets uh, that make you, you know, emotional mistakes. Realize that price inflation does not last forever. The larger the deviation from the mean, the greater the eventual reversion will be. Invest accordingly. Uh, that's a little bit. I got deep, and I got to think about that myself. Uh, however, fantastic article and written by. I'm sorry, I forgot because I've been talking so long. Uh, NZH, and it's called Bubbles Last Until They Don't. You can read it for free on Zero Hedge. Um, you notice I don't get the pop-up ads because I pay a buck a day, but you will get the pop-up ads. They are annoying, but, uh, you know, what do you want for free? <laughs> it's authored by Lance Roberts via realinvestmentsadvice.com, and uh, you, I guess you can find him on that link as well. So, like his articles, by the way. Uh, let's move out of there 
And uh, what's next on there? Stocks, bonds, Bitcoin slammed after a surge in CPI. Well, we kind of knew that the CPI was going to go up. But remember, folks, it's just temporary, according to uh, uh, our professionals and our officials and our, our corporate uh, uh, financial media. Just It's just temporary. Relax. No worries. Um, trans transitory U.S. consumer prices are rising at fastest pace in 30 years. Again, we don't have to read that. You know, our uh, corporate news tells us our, our government and uh, uh, their, their brilliant officials uh, all tell us, Relax, don't worry about it. You're okay. <laughs> well, if you believe that, I got a bridge for you in Brooklyn. So let's move down here. Uh, Goldman reports second. Well, no JPM beats thanks to three billion reserves. Uh, remember what I was talking about earlier uh, about uh, we're living in a world of crony capitalism. Uh, these two firms, in my opinion, in my opinion, JPM and Goldman are classic examples of uh, crony capitalism uh, to some degree. I mean, some you know people can make an argument against that and 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 for it, but uh, uh, more or less, uh, it's being in bed with uh, uh, being in bed with the government and being able to turn that into dollars, and that's what you got going on here with uh, these two, in my opinion. Don't forget, uh, who is it? One of these guys, was it Goldman or JPM? I think JPM got fined like, what, almost $900 million, almost a billion dollars or something uh, for manipulating gold and silver markets uh, or precious metal markets. Uh, but they made $4 billion. That's why they're still in business. And uh, the regulators usually uh, don't want to go after these guys because when they're done with their government job, they want to go to work for them. And you can't go to work for them if you've uh, 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 screwed over them. So <laughs> uh, that's my opinion. I think the, the regulators are either corrupt and or stupid. Uh, so let's move along from there. I've said that enough times. And GATA.org, uh, uh, Mike Ballinger, GATA, the original whistleblowers, I agree on 100. I've said that for a long time. If you don't have GATA.org on your bookmark bar up there and uh, you're a precious metal stacker, investor, whatever you want to call yourself, uh, you really don't know what's going on out there. You don't know who the players are. You don't know how the market's rigged. You don't know what uh, GATA.org does, and they've always been straightforward with it. Um, I think they are the original whistleblowers to some degree, but if you want to call it whistleblower, the original whistleblower, um, and again, this is up for debate. I think uh, uh, Ted is the uh, is the guy that's the original wh whistleblower, and we talk about Ted all the time. Ted Butler, uh, Mr. Butler has been talking about this for years. So to me, he is the original whistleblower. Uh, you can add the S on the end with the GATA.org guys and their organization. Uh, uh, again, uh, bookmark this if you're new to this video. You're going to find some really good stuff here. Irish branded gold bars to go on sale for the first time. Uh, that's interesting. It's nice to see uh, uh, the Dublin Assay Office. Uh, and gosh, they, oh, what have they been around for? Hold on, 384 years. I knew it because they've been making uh, 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 sterling flatware and hollowware. Um, so, so they've been around forever. I'm familiar with them for sure. Uh, nice to see. It's going to be a cool hallmark to see on a silver bar as well. And you can definitely trust those bars. So can't wait to see them on sale out there. New gold back world reserve currency is coming. We talked about it yesterday. Other great articles on here. I really want to read this. How Ottawa sees the golden opportunity to defeat the Nazis in World War II. By the way, Gold Antitrust Action Committee, GATA.org, explains all the manipulation right here. Uh, and make sure you uh, uh, bookmark it and uh, look at these articles once a week because there are some good articles. This one I missed and I definitely want to read. Uh, let's move along to a couple things here. Britain carves out exemption for gold clearing banks from Basel, written by Reuters. Um, and as you know from yesterday's video, I told you if you listen to Reuters, so if you listen to any corporate media, chances are you'll go broke when it comes to precious metals because they seldom have any clue what they're talking about. Uh, but more or less, what they're saying here is Britain uh, is trying to carve out exemptions or has carved out exemptions uh, uh, for that Basel III rule uh, for some of their uh, bullion banks. And, and he, again, I, I, you kind of knew it. You kind of know it. Uh, you, you, you know that that was a money-making deal for them. You have to ask why the Basel III uh, a rule uh, uh, required it to go to a tier one asset, which brings up another point. We're going to talk about tier one assets real quick here. A uh, lot of uh, legalistic uh, uh, pff, uh, language going on here, monkey hammering language going on here. Uh, but you know, as I said, I, I you know, it's like governments giving up fiat currency and going to a gold backed currency. I just don't see it happening. Why would they give up the golden goose um, if they can reinvent it or recreate it in a different way? And that's what I see uh, with this uh, Basel III rule. Uh, they'll recreate, they'll uh, find loopholes, they'll give them uh, reasons. But there was more to the Basel III than I think uh, uh, getting rid of those uh, paper derivatives or, or um, 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 
making them worth, you know, making them a tier three asset. Uh, and I felt that it had something to do with making gold a tier one asset. And you know, there's some misunderstanding of what tier one assets are exactly here. So uh, just to kind of clarify it, rather than make it up myself. And again, here, gold to be cleared, a tier one asset under new Basel three rules. Uh, this is by Silver Doctors here. The new Basel three rules are set to make gold a tier one asset for commercial banks compared to a tier three ranking it currently holds. This means that physical gold will count as capital, the same as a treasury bond. Uh, and again, there's a lot of people confusing what the, a tier one asset really meant in, in this particular instance and what it meant to the Basel three rules. Uh, demand for physical metals will increase substantially from this ruling, but you won't hear it mentioned on CNBC. The big new thing is gold capital adequacy, adequacy ratios. Um, a good article here uh, by uh, Sharps Pixley, forgive the hyperbole, uh, that talks about this, grabbing market share and functional. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, anyway, they talk about the uh, tier one asset, uh, but I think this highlighted thing explains exactly uh, why it's important um, uh, be because of uh, re readjusting how the uh, uh, tier you know, goal was looked at before as a tier three asset. Now as a tier, you know, it's on par with cash kind of. And let's take a look at uh, um, Investopedia. I told you I like their uh, definitions here. Uh, capital one versus tier two and again I think gold was a tier three asset I could be wrong but now it's a tier one uh, but let's just take a look at the difference between here uh, under Basel three a bank's title tier one tier must be at least ten um, blah 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 uh, the tier one is considered less uh, tier two capital is considered less reserve uh, here if you take away anything from this gold went from a tier three or tier two asset to a tier one and uh, and this is talking about a tier two uh, asset tier two capital is considered less and reliable than tier one capital because it's more difficult to accurately calculate and more difficult to liquidate uh, and again as I said uh, they they made gold a tier one asset and let's take a look at what Investopedia calls a tier one asset and a tier one capital uh, tier one capital is used to describe the capital adequacy of a bank and refers to core capital that includes equity capital and disclosed reserves. Equity capital is inclusive of instruments that cannot be redeemed at the option of the holder. Tier one capital is essentially the most perfect form of bank capital. And again, this is the importance of what I've said Basel three is about, is turning gold from a tier three into a tier one capital. Now, we can all talk about why they did it and what is the purpose behind making gold a tier three and a tier one. Uh, but I think that talk and that discussion is even more important than discussion whether they're going to get rid of a uh, uh, derivatives, you know, uh, or the derivative of trading in London because of the Basel three. Uh, the real talk should be about why they turned it from a tier three asset into a tier one asset. Uh, so a tier one asset is essentially the most perfect form of a bank's capital, the money the bank has stored to keep it functioning through all risky transaction it performs, such as trading, investing, and lending. Uh, so more or less, you know, physical gold itself is now considered a tier one asset. Uh, it's it's the equivalent of cash. That's important on every level. Uh, again, I think that point is missed by so many people out there discussing precious metals. Uh, how tier one capital works, you can read this for yourself. Again, I've got to shorten up this video, folks. We'll be here for a long time. But uh, this is Investopedia. Type in tier one capital. Uh, you'll get a couple. Again, I like DuckDuckGo because uh, they, they, they're... They don't sell your uh, searches to other people. Um, tier one capital, you'll see Investopedia has a few different um, tier one leverage ratio definition. So if you really, really want to learn more about uh, what's happened with Basel three and what a tier one asset is, a tier two, a tier three, uh, what the leverage ratio definition means, uh, Investopedia is an awesome place to look. And if you're going to understand this stuff or pretend you do, you at least know, need to know how this works a little bit. Here's a great place to look. Uh, I'll leave you with that, and we'll get into the yesterday's video, which was Reuters F's the Silver Apes. Uh, pardon for the F language, but it's kind of true. Uh, Reuters article yesterday out there just kind of, I thought it uh, threw the uh, uh, Silver Apes, Wall, Wall Street uh, uh, Silver uh, Ape people under the bus kind of. It made them look, it didn't make them look very smart, didn't make them look very, uh, that was my opinion and my take on it, just from the first couple paragraphs of it. Uh, I look at the, all these guys, uh, uneducated uh, uh, tradesmen that don't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, that, 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 that troubled me a little bit. So that was what yesterday's video was about. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for watching. I can't go into all 
the uh, comments on here. I'd love to. Uh, but as I said, uh, I'm just kind of taking a look here and seeing. Again, I want to thank everyone that says thank you and, and uh, appreciates my videos. I appreciate that. Even the ones that don't like my videos, I appreciate you too. Um, let's see here. And uh, is there anything specific here I can answer? Uh, uh, no, a lot of great comments and a lot of great questions. And really not too much uh, I can talk about. Hey, Benoit, what's going on? Uh, lack of credibility, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what you know. That's what I was talking about yesterday. Is that the, the hit angle about the the article and the Reuters piece was like they live in their basements, uh, and it, you know, I recognize it as soon as uh, I think another uh, uh, article, a guy that wrote articles out there, he was on ZH, made, said this basically same thing. It was condescending. Uh, Reuters wrote that condescending article, um, and that's what it exactly was. It was very condescending. Well, that's really about it. Uh, best deals out there, folks. If you're if you're gold and silver stacker, I'm going to tell you the best deals out silver. Buy a recognizable product. When I say recognizable product, I don't mean recognizable by a new person or e maybe even yourself if you don't have a lot of experience in the precious metals market. But recognizable by dealers, recognizable by people that are in the industry. Uh, so buy a good recognizable product that supplies the gold and silver uh, for the cheapest premium that you can. I don't care what the design looks like. I don't care if it's shaped like hearts, moons, or stars. Um, I don't care if it's crushed in two. Um, well, I do kind of. You, you want something you can stack at least. But uh, who cares what it looks like as long as it's a recognizable product and you're paying the cheapest premium you can. That's how you preserve your wealth. Now, if you like pretty products and you like paying big premiums on stuff, that's called being a collector. You need to kind of separate the two. Uh, and I can show you how to do that. You can have a lot of fun doing both, actually. Uh, and same thing, right now, don't spend more than $6 per ounce premium on silver. If you can get it for $4 per ounce, great. $3 per ounce, great. Uh, $5 per ounce. But, but don't spend more than $6 per ounce for any premiums on any products for silver. It's just crazy, insane, in my opinion. Um, I know I'm cutting about cutting out uh, locals from buying some of my inventory because I've got so many silver eagles. I've got a wholesale amount uh, because I'm not going to retail them to customers for stupid premiums. Even though the premiums on silver eagles have come down, there's still way better other products out there to buy. Uh, same thing with gold. Uh, stick with uh, um, bars if you can. I think bars you can buy in that $80 premium range. Uh, give or you know, actually don't spend more than 85 bucks an ounce for gold bars for good. Uh, recognizable brands. Uh, try to spend uh, 80, 85 in that range. If you're buying quantity, you are going to get it cheaper. So that's for sure. Uh, so uh, quantity does count, folks. It really does in the precious metals business. And uh, that's really about it. Uh, the other th advice I give you is buy local. I am in uh, Lauderdale by the Sea. I'm a brick and mortar store. I don't do any internet or online sales. Uh, however, if you don't live in my area, my recommendation is uh, find someone local, whether it's in your city, in your county, or your state, just to keep that money local. It's real important. Um, and uh, I advertise locally here in South Florida to beat uh, Atmex, to beat SD Bullion, and, X, and beat JM Bullion. All three are great online companies, except I'm local. You can walk into my store, uh, talk to me. I can give advice that they can't give. Uh, and that is free. That goes with what you you know you buy from me. Um, unfortunately, you're not going to get that from the three big companies. You're going to get uh, a no frill service, uh, and I can still beat their prices. So I can give you good advice and beat their prices, and you can deal with us face to face. I'd recommend anyone inside the country if you don't if you have local dealers that you can drive to, even if it's an hour or two, do that. Don't buy online, and that just is not bullion. That's tires, uh, jewelry, whatever. Try to buy your stuff locally. Keep that money local, folks. I can't tell you how important that is, especially in up-and-coming times. Uh, this is Brian Kuzmar with Commercial Rare Coins and Precious Metals at 954-493-8811. Call me anytime between 10 and 4, Mondays through Fridays. Happy to help you out with anything you need. And uh, really, that's about it. Let's see what happens tomorrow, and uh, have yourself a great day. Thanks for watching. And uh, make sure you hit that like and uh, subscribe button, too. Thanks. Bye.